Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us on a Saturday afternoon for this book talk and discussion. Care is a topic that touches each of our lives, yet often remains unspoken in its full depth and transformative details and potential. We at Mechanics Institute are excited to share with you the profound insights of Maurice Hamilton's revolutionary care, commitments, and ethos, and hope that you will take what you learned here today and weave in the re weave into the re rich tapestry of your own lived experiences and experiences going forward. My name is Nico Chen, and I am the program manager at Mechanics Institute. For those of you who are attending their first event sponsored here by Mechanics Institute, welcome. Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. Mechanics Institute features a full service general interest library, an internationally renowned chess club, ongoing author and literary programs and the cinema lit film series. A recent article in the San Francisco Standard describes us as the coolest library in downtown San Francisco and a remote work sanctuary. Come see this for yourself by joining us for a free tour, which happens every Wednesday at noon. We also welcome you to browse our upcoming events at milibrary.org backslash events. Now I will introduce the wonderful Maurice Hamilton. Maurice Hamilton is professor of philosophy and affiliate faculty of women, gender, and sexuality studies at Portland State University. He writes about the theory and application of feminist care ethics. His latest book, Revolutionary Care, Commitment, and Ethos argues that we need a care revolution right now, and you can participate. He is also author of Care Ethics and Poetry, The Social Philosophy of Jane Addams, Embodied Care, and Hail Mary, The Struggle for Ultimate Womanhood in Catholicism. Hamilton also holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Oregon and a PhD in religion and social ethics and an MBA from the University of Southern California. He is currently working as a consultant for two major grants in the UK on care ethics and aesthetics. He is a Fulbright specialist who will spend November of this year in Kyoto working with Japanese feminist care ethicists. For more information on his scholarly activities, please go to his website mhamington.com, which I will also be entering into our chat box today. Thank you once again for being here and for your willingness to engage in this personal and pers political exploration of care, especially on a beautiful Saturday afternoon like this. We will now move into Marie Maurice Hamilton's talk, and I hope that this will help us deepen our collective understanding of care ethics and inspire us to think about how we can further enact revolutionary care in our own lives and community. We will also have a Q&A with the audience after Maurice's talk, so please make sure to add your questions to the chat, and I will read them aloud once Maurice finishes. Maurice, please take us away. Thank you for that wonderful um, introduction, Nico, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, because we are a small group today, and, and it, you know we can keep it fairly informal, and if anybody wants to stop me at any time to uh, ask a question, just you know, raise your hand or uh, blurt out the question or whatever, and and uh, and we can do it uh, because we have a a pretty small intimate group here. Uh, I do want to begin with a brief uh, land acknowledgement. My school, Portland State University, is located in the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon, in Multnomah County, the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Wetlala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kayapua and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. I think it's important to acknowledge this place's ancestors and, and uh, recognize that we're here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. Uh, in remembering these communities, I honor their legacy, their lives and their descendants. And in making this acknowledgement, I endeavor to recognize the privilege that allows me to stand before you. If you know, given enough time, I would also do a labor acknowledgement uh, for all the labor that has uh, participated in allowing me to be here, and also a care acknowledgement for all the relationships that have uh, sustained me and allowed me to become who I am. As someone who presents as a white male, I've enjoyed many advantages not available um, to those with other identities. And, and really, 
Um, this talk is, is about building communities across diverse identities. And so these acknowledgements are not just lip service, but really kind of central to what uh, we're talking about here. Um, this presentation um, begins with a little story of transformation. And then I wanna talk about the, uh, the power of care, what good care is, what a commitment to care and what an ethos uh, of care is. Um, okay. So I'd like to start with a little story, and this is a story that's in the book, uh, Revolutionary Care. And it is um, every chapter of the book uh, begins uh, with an anecdote, a story uh, about care. And this first one is, and, and some of them are quite surprising. The first one is uh, a little unusual. It's about someone named Derek Black. Uh, you may have heard of Derek Black, who's uh, been in, in and out of the news over the last 10 years. He was born in 1989 in West Palm Beach, uh, Florida. He was the heir apparent to the uh, white nationalist movement in the United States. His godfather is David Duke, the former Grand Wizard of the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. His father, Don Black, popularized the term white nationalism and created the racist website stormfront.org. The Southern Poverty Law Center describes Stormfront as the murder capital of the internet uh, because of the number of racially motivated murders committed by members. It is the most popular white extremist website with over uh, 300,000 registered members. At age 10, Derek created a website for white nationalist children. In his early teens, he hosted a white nationalist radio program with his father. Um, despite his youth, he was an articulate, uh, smart, and popular speaker uh, and spoke often at white nationalist meetings. He was charismatic and he was quite comfortable defending his views against attack. And he was attacked a lot. Um, his uh, biographer, Eli Saslow, documented Derek Black's personal transformation in the book, Rising Out of Hatred, The Awakening of a Former White Nationalist. Uh, Saslow says, on the air, he, repeated, he repeatedly theorized about the criminal nature of Blacks and the inferior natural intelligence of Blacks and Hispanics. He said President Obama was anti-white culture, a radical black activist and inherently un-American. There was nothing micro about Derek's aggression. Uh, that was Saslow. Black's original posture of uh, exclusion makes a fascinating case for care theorists to contemplate given his evolution into an open-minded and compassionate individual. Um, his his story is kind of a challenge to care ethicists because, you know, we're talking about caring across difference. What about caring for people um, who we find their positions abhorrent? Um, can we care about those uh, folks? And um, I've been asked that question many times. In 2010, still steeped in his white nationalism, Black began attending the New College of Florida in Sarasota, uh, Florida. I don't know if you're following the news, but New College of uh, Florida uh, is one of Ron DeSantis's uh, target colleges. He's removed the entire board and put conservative uh, folks in charge there and is trying to transform the culture of it from a progressive to a very conservative institution, largely because of Derek Black's case and what happened um, here. So, um, while he was going to classes, Black maintained a low profile. He surreptitiously would host his radio show. He would go to class and then go off campus uh, to host the show. Eventually, his identity uh, came to light and he was confronted uh, even by a small mob in the uh, uh, on campus. Uh, but again, he's used to uh, defending himself against um, angry uh, um, attackers, and uh, he was okay, uh, you know, dealing with their with the with their concerns. Um, 
And, but a few students at New College took a different tact. Um, their names were Allison Gornick and Jewish students, Matthew Stevenson and Moshe Ash. They decided to befriend Black despite the fact that they did find his uh, positions abhorrent. Um, they wanted to understand him better and start a dialogue with him. So after much time spent together, including difficult but respectful listening and responding, Black gradually began to have a change of heart and mind. And I'm fast forwarding over uh, months, even years of uh, this. And again, it's all kind of chronicled uh, in Eli Saslow's book. At one point, Stephen explicitly uh, told Gornick that the relationship was transformative enough and he did not want to push too hard directly challenging Black's beliefs. Indeed, the presence of accepting Jewish friends who welcomed him, this was an idea that was anathema to white nationalists, right? Um, was sufficient for Black to start to question his views regarding cultural superiority. They had many shared meals and discussions. Eventually, Black came to the very difficult decision to renounce his white nationalism. Um, and he did so in a very public manner. Uh, he had a, an article, a, a letter published in the New York Times uh, renouncing it. This uh, was uh, uh, a major blow to the white nationalist uh, movement, the organizations that had been so supportive of him and his family. As you can imagine, he got all kinds of threats. His family got all kinds of threats because of this. Uh, his family also um, somewhat uh, turned their back on him. Um, Black continued to pursue his academic career, and he has now uh, completed a PhD in uh, in history. And he is a uh, he's a frequent commentator about um, issues in the uh, uh, of white nationalism. Um, he um, really regrets what part his he played in um uh during the uh, uh the election of Trump um in in fomenting white nationalist ideas but going back to the idea of care his coming out letter which was in the New York Times in 2016 specifically discussed how it was the relationships more so than simply arguments that transformed him. He said, uh, several years ago, I began attending a liberal college where my presence prompted huge controversy through many talks with devoted and diverse people there, people who chose to invite me into their dorms and, and have conversations rather than ostracize me. I began to realize the damage I had done. Um, it, it, um, at one point, there was a follow-up um, um, article done um, in the Daily Beast on Derek Black called Derek Black, the Reluctant Racist and His Exit from White Nationalism. And the author uh, wrote about Black's experience. And Derek, of course, corresponded with the author um, and said, you got everything right, except you didn't you didn't emphasize the caring relationship enough. He said, the people who were important in the process of changing my mind were those who, who were my friends regardless, but who let me know when we talked about it that they thought my beliefs were wrong for specific reasons and took the time to provide evidence and civil arguments. I didn't always agree with their ideas, but I listened and they listened to me. Care is a contextually driven moral approach and uh, care allowed Black to have a moral epiphany. It's within the crucible, within the, within the comfort, within the letting down of one's guard, within care, that uh, the imagination is allowed to flow and make connections. Um, there we have in today's world, powerful narratives of human division around fear and hate, and um, their black story isn't intended to say 
that this is the way to cure it or that this example is one that can be replicated in in other cases or or most cases or anything like that there won't be a simple formula for overcoming it but it does show the power of care uh in this because um as black credits it it's 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 really the care that transformed him and the book is um has a, a number of uh of stories that are uh like that uh in there um what i'd like to do is provide a little bit of background uh say a few words about care say a few words about the ethics of care and then talk about some of the concepts uh, in the book. And again, please feel free to stop me if um, I uh, uh, say something that's not clear. Um, okay, let, we'll start with care. Care is a ubiquitous term. Um, we use it all the time in many different ways, in many different sayings. And um, you also see it all the time in advertising. Um, as I watch advertising, uh, most every single corporation uh, claims that they care about you. Um, I've even seen uh, oil companies claim that they care uh, uh, about me. And um, that's an interesting kind of rhetorical phenomenon because it shows that these corporations know that there's something powerful about care. There's something basic about it. And so they they they're trying to co-opt it into their you know marketing campaigns, but it's also a hint um, at the at the power of care. Now, um, I should also say that care itself, um, out of context, is a is a kind of morally neutral word, because um, there's a lot of times where care is invoked, and it is uh, not done um in a good way in a way that you would that you know rises to what we might um, consider a good standard of care um for example uh colonial powers um, use the word care uh in a very paternalistic way uh you, you know you, you think about what's been done uh to indigenous people to pull them out of their their culture through the uh, through school systems that separate them from their family and their traditions uh, a lot of times that's couched in care. Abusers will often engage in cruel activities and, and also frame that as a kind of care. And even in disability studies or what sometimes today called crip theory, um, care is a negative term because uh, in for those with disabilities, sometimes care um, implies so much paternalism that it takes away their their agency their ability to to make their own decisions so care itself is um sometimes used in a, in a in a neutral or even a negative kind of way and um and so that's why in this book i actually address a lot of what good care is but i'll talk about that in a minute another thing i want to say about care is um care is a counter narrative to uh, kind of um, a meta-historical theme that we have that the history of the world is has been created through competition, survival of the fittest, you know, dog eat dog kind of uh, world. Well, there's a there's an alternative story around care that it is compassion and cooperation that has really allowed humanity to thrive and survive. And so um, care is so very important. We know as individuals that care is important because when we're born, we are extremely vulnerable. And um, uh, if somebody doesn't care for us um, immediately, then um, we will die. Uh, you know, we we really need to, ha to have people care for us. Um, so um care is care is very basic uh, to humanity also there's an embodied dimension to care care is uh first experienced through the body and it is delivered through the body i wrote a book over 20 years ago uh, ago called embodied care and um 
uh, where I make uh, where I make this point. And even when we do complex kind of caring, like when we develop policies for institutions or something that are caring, we're drawing upon metaphors that we know in our own body. Um, children understand care in their body even before they have language. They understand what care is. Okay, last point about care is it has historically not been valued in human history. And uh, part of that is because uh, care has been feminized, associated with uh, the work of women. And uh, women's work is, is uh, like all things that belong to women has, have been devalued. And it's only recently um, that uh, uh, care has been valued greater but even today, we still, you know, pay care laborers less. Uh, in my fields and in 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 scholarly fields, um, care has not up up until very recently been considered an important subject for consideration. Um, and and so, uh, kind of fighting against that baggage, that historical baggage. Um, okay, I'm going to turn my attention to something called the ethics of care or care ethics. Uh, that's a relational approach uh, to morality, very much driven by uh, context. Um, it is different than other moral approaches because time matters, proximity matters, imagination matters to care uh, in ways that um, traditional ethical approaches tended to try to figure out answers to moral dilemmas. There, you know, it's more like trying to figure out the right, the right thing to do. I mean, that's what Immanuel Kant said. What is the right thing to do? And in, and in care, um, care does care about what the right thing to do is, but it also cares about how we live our life and how we um, uh, exist in right relationship with one another. The term itself came into Western thought in the 1980s. Uh, it is um, uh, uh, by, and it bubbled up from different feminist scholars in um, uh, uh, in different fields, in psychology, in philosophy, in education. Um, and uh, at first it was very much a niche field of study. Uh, but today we're we're living in what I call the golden age of care ethics because it is um, now in all kinds of different fields. Uh, we've got lots of articles in business ethics journals on, uh, on, on care, in education, um, in um, geography, anthropology, the social sciences, the hard sciences, humanities. And it's across discipline and it's around the world. Um, Nico mentioned, I'm going to Japan. I spent a month with scholars in Italy. I spent a month with scholars in France working on care ethics. Um, every continent has uh, care ethicists. And now we have international organizations uh, that are working on care. We have conferences, multiple conferences every year on, on, on care ethics. There's journals devoted to it, a uh, uh, book um, a series um, devoted to it. And why is it so popular? Because traditional approaches aren't answering the questions in a way that really accounts for the human condition. Traditional analytic approaches, uh, today's neoliberal answers that are very market-driven, uh, uh, leave a lot of people wanting. Um, there's plenty of books, uh, and I have a bunch of them, that are titled something to do with the crisis of care in the world. And, and so, you know, how do we elevate care? How do we make it more central? How do we bring it to the center of our being? That's, you know, kind of what the ethic of care um, uh, tries to do. Uh, a few more things about the ethics of care. One is that um, it, uh, some people, because care is such a ubiquitous word, some people um, have trouble uh, separating it from common understandings. And so I want to make it clear, for example, that care is not altruism in its absolute sense. You know, sometimes we think of al altruism as like, I have to be completely selfless. I can only be motivated by doing something good for somebody else. Well, it's good to have those kinds of motivations, 
but care does not have some kind of standard or perfection um, to it. You can care about yourself. Self-care is very important because uh, if you don't care for yourself, it's going to make it hard to care for others in any kind of meaningful way. And so you can have care for the um, uh, the, the self. Uh, you can have, um, you know, motivations that aren't always the purest and it still uh, has the impact, uh, you know, of care. Um, another misconception about care is that care means that it ends disagreement or conflict. And that's not true. When you're in a caring community, you feel more comfortable bringing up your concerns. And so conflict doesn't go away. In fact, it actually, in a way, uh, fosters the discussion of conflict in a caring environment. And the other thing about, about care is it is not just about good feelings. There has to be um, actions uh, involved. Um, also, I should say that care is not just a personal morality. Sometimes it gets confused uh, with that, um, that is just, you know, on the personal level, but it also has a strong political dimension. I um, advise you to go to the website for Black Lives Matter and read their founding documents and their mission statement. You will see care written through it all, a very inclusive approach um, uh, to care. So I wrote Revolutionary Care to clarify a few things. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the book right now. The first half of the, so there, it's divided into two parts. The first half of the book is uh, more some theoretical concepts uh, that I wanted to explore a little deeper. And then um, the second half of the book are some what I call controversial um, invitations and provocations. Uh, what I mean by that is sometimes care ethicists are a little bit um, uh, reluctant to enter into difficult conversations because care is so contextual and uh, and and you and you can't and it, it doesn't have kind of an absolute uh, rule based to it. But what I say is like if you buy my argument in the first part of the book and that you have a commitment to care, that maybe you should consider these controversial ideas. Okay, so let me go back to uh, just a few um, of the theoretical ideas in general. I, I think perhaps the most important one um, of the first half of the book is the concept of good care. And the concept of good care is controversial, as I said, because care is so very contextual. But I don't actually give you the answer to what good care is. What I, give, what I describe good care as is, is a set of skills it's a methodology, it's a process. So good care, um, I describe as having three things, humble inquiry, inclusive connection, and responsive action. Humble inquiry, confronting the other and uh, with humility, not knowing the answers, not prejudging the person, but engaging in inquiry and trying to understand them um, a little bit better. Um, the second is inclusive connection. Uh, we're more motivated if we make a connection with the other. And it's easy to make uh, connections with those who are family and friends of us, those we're close to. The hard thing to do is uh, to include others. That's why I call it inclusive connection. Um, uh, making that connection is the imaginative, the empathetic part of care. And empathy is a big theme uh, within care. And then the final thing is responsive action. Not just action, but responsive action, responding to the need of the other. Not prejudging, not knowing what the answer is, but responding to their need. Those three things, I think, are hallmarks of good care. And they don't, it's not formulaic. It doesn't come in any particular order. Um, and sometimes um, it doesn't come at all, but, but good deep care has those um, things. Um, I'm, um, Nico, I know I'm uh, about out of time. I'm just going to go a little bit longer because- Of course, that's we have, uh, time. Yeah, we have a small group anyway, so I'm just going to go a little longer. Um, so besides good care, I talk about the, the norms of care and trying to raise the social standards um, around care. 
And in particular, I think that we can have, uh, you know, a care movement, a revolution of, uh, of care, um, where we have more humble inquiry, more inclusion, and more responsive action. Um, and uh, what I think is different about care ethics versus other approaches is that instead of knowing what right and wrong is, uh, uh, irrespective of the situation, care ethics is more improvisational. Again, it's a methodology, and so it, it the the um, uh, the the right thing to do, the norm emerges from the situation. All I know is I want to care. I don't know exactly how to care for you until we uh, meet one another and I understand your needs. And then, um, uh, uh, it, you know, if I, if I engage you properly, then I may know how to care for you better. Um, okay, so I talk about norms. I spend another chapter talking about the concept of commitment. Um, and I, I like this word commitment when it comes to morality, because a lot of times when we think about morality, we think about rules that are imposed upon us from the outside, uh, duties, laws, uh, commandments, whatever. But um, with commitment, that's internal. That's where I have agency. Commitment is, uh, is you know, in part very motivating, right? Because I've committed to this, you know? And so, you know, for example, when you commit yourself to a relationship, you, um, uh, there is motivation there. Uh, you've made this decision and so your um, uh, your your engagement becomes kind of an abiding part of who you are. It transforms your um, own identity. Um, so I spent a, a chapter on identity. I mean, on commitment, and then I also spend a chapter on uh, what I call the ethos of care. This word ethos, I think, is very interesting. It's a it's what I describe as a kind of care spirituality. Um, it's a, um, it's this, uh, this idea that, um, I'm going to have this spirit of care. I'm going to enter my relationships in a kind of open way where I'm looking for opportunities, um, uh, to care as they arise and, um, and, uh, try to engage, you know, in the practices of good care. The thing about a spirit of care, like all spirits, it can be contagious. And this is where we can transform uh, communities, groups, institutions. Uh, and so, uh, and it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter if uh, I'm talking about a university, um, a hospital, uh, a church group, or the Mechanics Institute. If uh, you see your colleagues operating with a spirit of care for one another, and for uh, those that you confront, it becomes a kind of contagion. Because remember I said, um, care is embodied. You have the capacities to care. That doesn't mean we always practice it. That doesn't mean we, uh, you know, some of our capacities have an atrophied from lack of use, but it's there. And so the spirit of care uh, can uh, raise us up uh, in that way. So um, again, the second half of the book is the more controversial part of it. So I've set out the theoretical and I say, okay, so if you're if you're going to be committed to care, um, you may want to um, consider, again, it's a provocation. It's not a rule. I'm not telling you what good care is for you. I'm just saying you may want to think about some of these radical positions, okay? So if we're um, thinking about care as revolutionary, that means there may be some radical positions to this. And so uh, one I discuss is feminism. I spent a chapter on feminism as a way to resist toxic masculinity because we have many forms of masculinity that are anti-caring, that keep caring at arm's length. Uh, and so to challenge that, thinking about uh, you know, committing to feminism as well. Again, just a provocation. Um, another one is uh, socialism not so much like a particular form of economy, but a an economy that puts society at the center, okay? So I'm not, you know, I'm not specifically talking about Marxism or any, you know, I'm not a technical economist. What I'm saying is uh, trying to create a care economy where the highest standard is how we care 
for our society and, and how we put, for example, infrastructure in place to care for one another. So socialism. The third one is humanism. Humanism. Why humanism? To resist a kind of religious dogmatism. Uh, one uh, another. Whenever we get dogmatic, whenever rules become more important than people, there is the possibility of separating us uh, from one another. And so um, I um, I think of care ethics as agnostic about religion. Uh, a care ethicist shouldn't care if you're religious or not. That's not important. What's important is, is that you're not ideological and dogmatic to the point where the rules become more important than the people. Um, the fourth thing I have is uh, veganism. Uh, again, um, to try to think about our relationships to the non-human world and uh, caring um, that is holistic um, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, and taking that uh, to thinking about the pain and suffering of other beings. So all of that is, uh, th so that's, that's kind of a, a quick summary of the book. Well, there is one, there is the final chapter, the conclusion where I talk about revolutionary care. And that is, I take, uh, uh, I take, uh, a lot of work from this German uh, feminist, Eva von Redeker, who has looked at the history of revolutions in the world. And even though our, our imagination, we like to think about revolutions as these events um, that she says they're actually, uh, revolutions are always a process. And you can have those events or not have those events. Uh, and we have revolutions that didn't have events it's just a process of change, a transformation of uh, of uh, of society uh, that um, uh, usually takes a lot of individual kinds of efforts. And I think that we can have a care revolution uh, where we put relationships uh, and uh, and how we include others uh, at the forefront uh, and bring this um, about. Um, I'm going to stop with just going back to um, I'm going to go back to the words of uh, of Nell Noddings. Um, when this originally was a teacher's tea, I was going to uh, talk um, uh, about education. And so Nell Noddings is quite appropriate, but I can still end with her words. She um, uh, has a as a she has a quote that I put on all of my syllabi. Nell Noddings was one of the founding mothers of care ethics. She was a Stanford philosopher and educator um, who taught high school and then uh, university uh, level. Uh, and she passed away last November. Um, uh, the quote is, uh, the student is always more important than the subject. The student is more, always more important than the subject. And that sounds really kind of common sense to most people. But any of us who are in education know that we get so fixated on our, on our area, our field of study and what we're teaching that we sometimes think that, you know, we got to focus on that. This is kind of similar to my comment about ideology, that we got to remember that the people are more important. And so the student, the well-being of the student is more important than the subject. And if we extend that out, uh, to, for example, workers, um, then workers are more important than the work that they do. Um, leader, uh, uh, leaders are more important than the responsibilities that they have. We have to always remember there's people behind these titles and that we, uh, and that we can care across those um, distinctions. Okay, I kind of whipped through a lot of things there. Uh, I can, I'm happy to talk further about uh, any subject or fill in anything that I uh, may have just kind of uh, given kind of a super superficial uh, coverage to. Thank you for sharing all this um, with us, Maurice Hamilton. Um, I think Alyssa has a question. Um, Alyssa, do you want me to read your question aloud or would you like to read it yourself? I can. I can. Oh, Alyssa, you cut out for a moment there. I, my question sort of jumped back to 
when you were talking about this idea of care being very feminized and how we can work to balance that. And then on the flip side, I wrote this, care can be really tiring as a woman <laughs> and it's not as expected as men. And so I often feel like, and it has been named even in my field, like when people need things, I feel like, we sometimes as women, we flip into a very caring position and it is not expected of men to do the same. Um, so like, how can we work to name that and balance that? Well, I mean, your question um, shows an insight into, you know, this phenomenon uh, that's going on. And it is still true uh, today, even um, after decades of feminism, that the burden of care still um falls more on women. Um, the good news is uh, that we see some of the norms changing, even if all the behaviors haven't com uh, completely changed. And you can kind of mirror this in care ethics. Um, at first, in the 1980s, it was all women feminist philosophers who were writing about it. And now we have a lot of men who are uh, writing about care um, you know, and 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 talking about issues of masculinity uh, and uh, and uh, and care. In fact, there is a uh, there's a there's a new podcast. They only have like a handful of podcasts um, by uh, somebody by the name of Rob Martin called um, uh, Careful Careful Thinking. I think is what it's called. And it's a podcast, uh, and 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 Rob is, is uh, actually a religion scholar who is uh, who has written about issues of masculinity uh, and care. Oh, and there's a wonderful book uh, by an anthropologist uh, who had to care for his severely disabled son, and did a study on men and what it did to their masculinity, thinking about uh, you know care, um, and so. You know, I um, that's why I spend a, a chapter talking about uh, about feminism. Um, as Bell Hooks said, feminism is for everyone, and we really need to um, uh, shift the thinking about uh, the care burdens in society. And you know, how do we get there? We get there uh, by people talking about it, by changing policies. Uh, and practices. Um, and, you know, it's going to be a slow grind. Uh, these are quite entrenched ideas in society. Uh, but there uh, but there are many people working to kind of uh, push us um, in a different direction. Uh, and, um, uh, and, you know, I hope that this book, Revolutionary Care, has some uh, small uh, push in that direction as well. And I want to just piggyback off of that, Maurice. Um, I know that the field of philosophy has been around for eons, and care ethics kind of only really appeared in, you know, through Nell Nottings's work in like the 80s, right? And so it's only really been around for about 40 years. And even in my own experience in academia, I didn't come across care ethics until my late 30s. And I you know, was interested in reading philosophy and other theories from other works. And it really took that deep, difficult time during the pandemic of like wafting through just the miasma of educational theory that I came across your work and it was an aha moment. So this is not something that was taught within my class. This was something that through like a deep, uncaring period in time when we were all, you know, deeply afraid of the sickness that I actually found care ethics to kind of be a beacon in this in this difficult time. That's a I mean that's a great story and it's it's so very true. Um, um, I never took a care ethics course in graduate school. I don't know that there were any available. I'm currently teaching care ethics. I teach care ethics courses in in, in uh, at Portland State University. And uh, when I go to Japan for a month, I'll be teaching graduate students a care ethics course, you know, um, uh, while I'm there. But it's slowly um, uh, catching on. Just earlier, um, no, I guess last year, at the end of last year, 
I did an informal survey through my own listservs and contacts. Um, and I wanted to know how many people were teaching a care ethics course uh, at their school and um, uh, and at what level. And I, I got well over 100 responses of, uh, of faculty. So things are changing, but things are changing slowly. You know, um, uh, you know, perhaps if you if you went to school today, maybe your odds of of of, of getting a care ethics uh, course, uh, you know, would be. Uh, increased, but uh, it is a relatively new. And and just like you, there's there's a hunger out there. I have graduate students contacting me from all over. Um, I had an economic student from the UK wanted it, to, uh, you know, care ethics. Uh, I had a um, a design uh, graduate student from um, Spain wanted to uh, to do um, care ethics. Uh, several in social work from India. Um, India seems to be really uh, catching on. I did three presentations uh, online for, uh, for uh, schools in India last year. Um, there is there's a hunger out there, and uh, that's a good sign. Um, and you know, hopefully, the momentum will keep up and uh, we'll we'll start to um, shift it because there's there's something new. There's something about care that seems to fulfill a need. And Maurice, um, I wanted to ask a question that emerged. You talk about story, and you know, um, you, you it's funny because usually in academia we talk about case studies, right? But you talk about it as a story. Why is story so important, and how does um, it intersect with care ethics? Um, well, a couple. Let, let me say a couple of things. Um, what happens with a case study is um, a case study is always a kind of reduction uh, and doesn't take into account all the variables of society. You know, so uh, the one of the classic case studies uh, that is, in, you know, very popular in ethics today in, in, in they, they write a, there's books on it and all kinds of discussions is the trolley problem. Okay, the, this, this trolley problem, there's runaway trolley and you're, uh, you can pull a lever and it can go this way and, and uh, it, it's gonna kill people if, if you let it go, but if you pull a lever, maybe it'll kill less. And there's all kinds of variations on this case study. The problem with case studies is that they're, they're just reductionist. They, um, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't take into account issues of time, space, and variability. Um, and, um, and so with care ethics, you know, care ethics, uh, in, in some of the original work on care ethics, um, it came out that a lot of people didn't like case studies. This is Carol Gilligan's original work in A Different Voice. Didn't like case studies uh, because it was just too truncated. It didn't um, allow for uh, more questions to be asked and, and, and answers. Now, why do, so, okay, so what's that versus me telling stories? Or I wrote the book, Care Ethics and Poetry. You know, why uh, poetry? Because um, there um, you, you get a little kind of slice of the human condition. And it's not so much a case study um, as it is a bit of an insight into um, actual uh, people's lives. And I, and I think um, the power of story, you know, why do we love stories? Why do we love novels? We are drawn in our imaginations. We empathize with the characters and we start to draw connections and understanding uh, in it. And so this is why, you know, the arts, have a great capacity to help us with our with our caring, right? Because they can uh, they can uh, spark uh, the imagination. They can allow us uh, those kinds of moral epiphanies uh, where maybe we think about um, you know others uh, differently. Um, there, I'm writing a chapter for a book where I'm um, I'm starting with the the story of uh the the old comedy television show will and grace 
Um, because Will and Grace occurred at a unique time in history where in the United States, we were passing all kinds of anti-same-sex marriage laws. Um, and then uh, what, uh, you know, Pew and other um, surveying companies said was the fastest transformation they've ever seen um, in the, you know, in the span of a decade or so, we became very accepting, generally speaking, of same-sex marriage in this country. I know there's a, currently a little bit of a backlash going on, but but uh, we became much more accepting. And during that period of time, you know, there uh, some people have raised the question of uh, what role did Will and Grace have? And, and and again, we watched this TV show. It was funny. We connected with the characters. We empathized. And, you know, for some people they go, huh, you know, uh, maybe Will and Jack uh, are just kind of like us and they want to be happy and live fulfilling lives and have relationships. And there is a kind of connection that's made, um, you know, through those kinds of stories, even if it's just commercial television. So um, uh, actually, at one point uh, when um, Biden was vice president under Obama, he actually uh, he actually uh, claimed perhaps a little bit too profusely that uh, Will and Grace did more for advancing same-sex marriage than uh, than anything. Uh, he might have been a little bit too optimistic, but um, still, the point is that the that that kind of connection and story makes a difference in people's lives. And so uh, I do think stories are important. Um, what you are saying, Maurice, makes my heart sing because um, the Mechanics Institute has a monthly storytelling showcase and it really connects our community together. We're also working with master storyteller Kate Farrell to um, do a storytelling workshop that will culminate in a, in a, in a showcase as well. So, you know, this is helps me realize that this work is actually deeply caring on some level as well. And, you know, we are also celebrating National Poetry Month soon, and I wanted to read a poem that you included in Revolutionary Care. Um, if you will give me just um, a minute to read this. It's Inquiry by Lisa Devuono. I hope I pronounced that last name right, Devuono. Start with your own question. It doesn't have to be profound. It just has to have a wondering. So you have no idea where it might lead. Not only no idea, but no worry about how far from your own clutching it might take you. A question that doesn't have one answer rather opens the, op the possibility for even more. Not ones that have been living under that tired story buried on the back of your heart. Start with a question that doesn't make you feel like this is the only one you'll ever have, but one that can hold you like a hammock or a cradle, or an old painted rowboat in which you might let yourself drift far enough away from the shore of familiar. Maurice, can you just talk a little bit about why you decided to choose this poem and include it in this book, and also how care ethics is connected with poetry? Uh, yeah, thank you for reading that. Um, I think the spirit of that poem really kind of captured uh, a disposition of care. There's a French concept uh, called disponsibilité. It's a kind of openness, uh, a morality that, um, um, oh, I forgot his name, uh, so, uh, Gabriel Marcel, a French, uh, uh, a French thinker uh, developed. And, um, you know this this the the openness that this poem um uh described and allowing life to to take you this is the the improvisational aspect uh of care um that you know we i don't know you just don't know the answers you got to kind of follow the questions uh sometimes and um and again i think uh poetry is kind of an amazing thing it's actually relatively few words, but poets are so good at capturing human emotion and feeling 
and 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 connection that they can have a profound impact in what really is an economy of words uh and and, and so um the arts and the humanities i think are so very important uh you, you know right now they're they're under attack in our neoliberal world right um the market uh, so that this is, has has you know kind of declared that this is a frivolous activity, uh, you know, not worthy of teaching or spending as much time on, but it actually is extremely important uh, to our imagination. And um, one of the exciting things going on with the ethics of care is uh, the whole new field of care aesthetics, and we have uh, poets. Um, artists, uh, dramaturgists, performers, uh, even dancers who are uh, discussing care in very rich kind of ways and what uh, and 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 through the arts, we can um, learn so much uh, about uh, what it is uh, uh, what it is to care. I mean, even, just delving into our own emotions and un understanding our own emotions in a way that allows us to understand others better is so important. And we don't, we don't take time to do that kind of work, generally speaking. I mean, you don't have an elementary school class in the emotions or relationships. We don't have those things. Uh, if you're lucky, we have some classes on the arts. And uh, and those are these these really these really great opportunities for um, for self exploration. Uh, if you know, if I were in charge of things, I would have everyone uh, take a course in acting, uh, for example, not acting in order to become a professional actor. But in order to study the human condition, what do actors do? They study emotions, they study how to comport one another, they interpret, they inhabit, uh, you know, uh, uh, characters. And what a wonderful skill of empathy and understanding um, that is. Um, so, uh, so I, you know, I'm a big, uh, supporter of the arts. And I think in some ways, you know, the fact that it's called the ethics of care is very limiting because ethics has this very narrow understanding in Western tradition. But care aesthetics to me opens it up uh, quite a bit. And I like the fact that we have scholars uh, who are doing that kind of work. Just to extend that, um, Maurice, I think that perfectly segues to one line in your acknowledgments of your book. And you write, I repeatedly find that care theorists practice what they theorize about. Um, so, you know, I think in a lot of academia, we theorize, 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 but then there's a wall. But then how does sort of care theory kind of, I don't know, help that wall dis dissipate between theory and practice? Um, you know, that was mostly an observation about my colleagues all over the world, uh, who, who, who do care ethics. And, um, I have just found them very, um, open and willing to help, uh, new students, um, uh, each other, uh, in, in, in a multiplicity, uh, multiple ways. And I think, you know, I think that kind of um, integrity and consistency uh, is is very refreshing, uh, and um, and I think um, you know as teachers we uh, we can do lots of things, but if we if we practice care, that's going to have more of an impact on our students than anything we can say. Last month, I had the pleasure of hearing 
uh, the president of West Georgia State University talk, who is on one of the boards of uh, an organization for public uh, universities and he, very articulate um, uh, speaker and rhetorician. But he was talking about how, uh, he, well, he, one thing he was talking about was a, a Pew survey from 10 years ago um, that looked at college graduates 30 years after graduation and what had the biggest impact on their lives. And um, uh, they named a number of things, but the the top uh, three included when a faculty member was acted caring toward me. I mean, the others were kind of relational as well, mentorship and that kind of stuff. But, but um, and this study was looking at how um, happy they were with their lives, how it, um, fulfilled they were with their lives. And, and so these relational moments that we have, these opportunities are so important. Uh, and I aspire to be, you know, one of these scholars, one of these carathesis who, you know, never turns away a student and always tries to find a way uh, to care for them, because I think that will have a much bigger impact than any, you know, piece of information or interesting theory I have uh, uh, about care. You got to, you kind of, you kind of have to show it, right? It's embodied care. So it has to be there, I think. And I would also love to loop back to um, your idea that theater can be more than just craft, but actual embodied learning. And, you know, my colleague Alyssa is actually um, pra practices the theater arts in her past as well. Um, Alyssa, um, I invite you to also um, maybe whether or not you want to, to confirm or sort of push back on what Maurice Hamilton's um, uh, theory is that, you know, these types of acting classes could perhaps um, teach us how to better care. Um, what do you think, Alyssa? Are you are you still around? Oh, I, no, I totally agree. I think practicing embodiment and empathy allows us to figure out how to do that. I, I mean, that would actually be interesting. Isn't there a lot of research on like how, you know, it's that fake it till you make it kind of feeling, right? Yeah, there's, um, I think there's, um, there are, uh, I, I think when I was writing The Embodied Care, or maybe one of my other um, uh, published works, I was uh, doing some research and I found um, acting teachers at universities who would teach classes on acting for life, you know, again, as opposed to trying to become a professional actor, right? Uh, but learning some of the skills, the the attention, um, Oh yeah, there's a there's a whole field called performance philosophy. Uh, it's it's relatively new. They've got a great website and lots of free stuff there if you ever go to it. Uh, uh, performance philosophy, and um, the the founder of that uh, that movement uh, discusses uh, theater as attention training. Isn't that interesting? Attention training. And, you know, what do we want to do in care? We want to attend to the other. Uh, Nell Nottings would talk about being engrossed with the other, but it's a it's an attending. It's my concept of humble inquiry, you know, with the other. And so if 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 theater is attention training, um, you know, then then that seems like uh, an excellent skill uh, for caring people uh, to have. There is. Uh, some scholars in Italy at the University of Verona who um, have developed uh, systems for uh, K-12 students, young children, to um, be able to identify their own emotions and identify and deal with the emotions of others uh, at a very young age um, with the with, you know with the idea that that's going that kind of attention training is going to be um helpful for them in their relationships and and and, and dealing with others uh it's already had wonderful results in terms of 
uh, reducing uh, some of the aggressive conflict in, uh, in elementary schools. Uh, but more importantly, I think it's a knowledge you know, that, that's important for us. Again, as I said before, we don't pay attention to any of those um, quote unquote soft skills. I don't like calling them soft skills because I think they're important skills, but the soft skills in um our uh in our education system and i think we should and and it can be couched in uh you know this this idea of making us more uh caring and fulfilled adults um to connect what you said maurice um there's a beautiful essay or chapter by the um by, by the wonderful philosopher um simone ve about attention and she talks about how attention is not just um, focusing on certain things, which a lot of our educational system does. It focuses on like your reading and writing skills in a very particular way. But she talks about attention almost like being able to go to like the top of a mountain and seeing kind of the vista and being aware of just how complex the natural ecosystem is around you. Um, what you consider Simone Weil to be part of care ethics in her sort of approach to attention? Yeah, there are um, a lot of, um, there are a lot of, uh, what, 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 how should we describe it? Care ethics adjacent scholars. Uh, Simone Weil, you know, uh, didn't use the term care ethics, uh, but um, has been quoted by uh, many care ethicists. Uh, and uh, their scholarship is uh, is important uh, uh, for them. So, um, yes, and, um, you know, I, I started to say something. I don't think I finished it uh, completely uh, when I was uh, doing the introduction. You, you know, I said that, uh, that care ethics um, was developed, you know, the idea came into Western thinking in the 1980s. And the reason I say it that way is because there's a lot of non-Western and indigenous uh, traditions that have contemplated care in very deep and complex ways. And we can learn a lot from them. Uh, uh, you know, just some examples would be like the Cree uh, in, in Canada uh, have a concept called Wakatakan, which is um, which is very much a care uh, culture. Uh, to it, uh, there is um, there's the African notion. I forgot the name now, but there's an African notion that's very similar to care. Um, there have been articles about Confucian care, uh, uh, drawing on 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 concept. There's actually quite a few articles um, uh, about it. And so, anyway, my point is that um, I don't want to. Um, have the hubris to say that uh, that you know care ethics is this uh, unique Western thing. It's not. Uh, there's uh, there's lots of um, uh, lots of traditions that um, we should uh, we should try to learn from. You're, you're oh, I'm, I'm going to add a pin to my video because I wanted to share with you also a land acknowledgement from um, the San Francisco Public Library, um, because oftentimes, you know, I, I am still learning how to care across differences. And I'm still at a moment in time when I'm not quite sure how to do a land acknowledgement that is, I don't know, like it, it lands well, but this one actually is for children. And I work with um, the Mechanics Institute on our family story hour. And this is the one that I use with children, which is here is the land, touch the ground <laughs> and here is the sky touch reach up to the sky here are my friends and we we, we we open our arms out to friends and here am i and i hug myself and then i say um we stand together hand in hand and thank the ramatush ohlone the traditional caretakers of this land this land on which we like to play we promise to look after it every day and you know, I think this land acknowledgement also attests to sort of the validity of care ethics because it's such an embodied thing and children understand care extremely well. And sometimes I think of it as we as children know how to care, but we sometimes forget about that. Like what is it 
of the human experience in an adulthood that we um, forget? Um, and that would be my last question for you today, Reese. Uh, well, I, I think it's, um, it, you know, it's a common phenomenon. You, you, you've probably heard studies where, you know, uh, children of different culture, uh, babies or young children of different cultures are put together. They play just fine, you know, and it's only as they grow is the, these narratives of division and fear, uh, you know, seep into our, you know, our, our way of being that we, that, um, uh, that we have these, these struggles, but it's, um, but that's why I'm so hopeful is because at, at bottom, our, our, we, we have the capacity to care. We want to care. Um, and we want to be cared for if we could get past our prejudices and, uh, and these stories that we tell about one another. Um, I, I you know, I think, you know, care can really flourish. I loved your um, acknowledgement. I've been, I've been working for the last year, and last week I spent the entire uh, week at uh, Cal Poly Humboldt in uh, in Northern California, uh, working with their Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and uh, we're working on a campus wide care ethics, uh, care ethos, really a spirit of care. It's going to be in their anti-racist language. It's going to be in their constitution, all kinds of things. We're, we're trying to infuse the language of care and raise the value of care on that campus um, uh, because it is a Hispanic serving institution um, amongst other things. Uh, the reason I bring it up is uh, they've developed a rich system of doing a land acknowledgement, a labor acknowledgement, and we uh, together, we kind of started the beginnings of developing a care uh, acknowledgement, a kind of a relational acknowledgement, um, you know, and I, and, you know, what do these acknowledgements do? They situate us, they put us in connection and relationship uh, with others and get us away from this disembodied uh, head that's going to be, uh, you know, kind of speaking or, you um, uh, and and just it's kind of a nice uh, a nice re uh, reminder and I and I for me it's also you know a kind of a reminder around humility uh, too um, uh, to remember uh, given all the oppression in the world you know how very privileged I am and I've been very privileged to be uh, a part of this afternoon. Well, Maurice, thank you so much for being here with us. I'm also going to pop into our link, uh, our chat box, the link to purchase Maurice's book. And Maurice, I know a lot of our members are interested in getting their books signed. Is there any way to actually do that? Um, I, I would love to come to San Francisco and the Mechanics Institute sometime in the future, and uh, maybe we can work that out. You know, of course. Okay. And would you like to also share any of the upcoming events that you have that you also want us to partake in? Um, let's see. I, you know, there's going to be, I think there's going to be a book launch uh, uh, sponsored by others, but I don't actually have any events. Uh, I don't have any events to talk about. Uh, I know there's presentations I'm going to be doing, but I don't have anything to, uh, to announce specifically. Yeah. Well, Check we are, my website. Of course. We are very blessed to have you come and join us on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. I know that we all could be outside and just enjoying Mother Nature in her most caring majesty. But I think this is also a very caring space, a caring holding space that you have created for us today, Maurice. Uh, thank you. And um, for those of you who um, want to say goodbye, um, I welcome you to turn on your cameras to wave goodbye to Maurice and share your care, embodied care uh, visually with us today. If not, and you want to keep your privacy, that's also okay. But um, Maurice, I will be following up with you soon. And thank you again for um, doing this event with us here at Mechanics Institute. Sure thing. Thank you, Nico. Malcolm, thanks for coming. Alyssa, uh, thanks. And um, I, you know, I'm, I've been so happy to learn about the Mechanics Institute and I want to be, uh, supportive of you in the future.
All right, thank you. And um, Maurice, I'll follow thank up. Thank you soon. so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maurice, I'll follow up soon with you. Okay, take care. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.